Okay, well, welcome everyone. Uh, I am uh, Xavier Martin of the uh, uh, Strategic Management Division of the Academy of Management and uh, your host for the 11th uh, and uh, the first of the third week of our series of uh, Need the Scholar. Uh, uh, we'll, uh, of course, introduce our, uh, our host, uh, our guest today, uh, Henrich Grever, in more detail in a, in a minute or two. But before I do that, I'd like to uh, also uh, give a nod to uh, three people who will be uh, helping us along with, uh, with the process of this interview today. Uh, Nell Dutt um, is uh, a member of our executive committee or leadership team of the uh, Strategic Management Division. Uh, Wei Vivian Guo is a uh, member of our membership engagement committee. And Tom Moliterno has kindly agreed to join us today as a, as a backup slash co-host slash a, a goodwill ambassador and, and supporter in case uh, there are any issues with connections. Uh, as an IB scholar, I, I'm a great believer in the value of uh, diversification. And so having a US-based person on the call is also, can also be a, a good insurance. Uh, of course, I'd like to uh, welcome Henrik uh, Greve. Uh, Enric uh, was uh, very kind to make himself available at what is uh, for him uh, uh, already uh, uh, mid to late uh, evening. So uh, thank you very much for, for joining us, Henrik, uh, and uh, we look forward to, uh, to the connection. Um, can, you, uh, can you speak up a little bit so, everybody can, so we can be sure that everybody can hear you, Henrik? Yeah, so let me just say that it's a great pleasure to uh, be invited and uh, really enjoy um, uh, hearing the questions and seeing how this uh, is going to turn out. So, good thing for the Wonderful. division to have this type of in, uh, initiative. Yes, thank you, and thank you again for making yourself available amidst uh, how much else is going on, especially uh, well, including at your institution, of course, as well as me. Um, all right, so I allow myself to give a bit of background about Henrik. Uh, his, uh, his his trajectory is, I think, something that many of you will find interesting. Uh, to, uh, um, to, to hear about uh, as we go through, uh, through this interview, then I'll tell you a little bit more about the format of this interview and uh, we will do so. So in terms of format, just to get started though, um, we, uh, first you should all be aware that this um, uh, session is being recorded and uh, you'll be able to see the uh, recording on the uh, STR uh, channel uh, within a few days, I believe. Uh, second, in terms of our time, we will uh, split the time roughly halfway. The first half of this session will consist of uh, uh, a series of uh, questions that I will ask of uh, Henry to try to discover who he is as an individual, as a person, his uh, broad interests, as well as, of course, his scholarly trajectory and, uh, and interests and uh, advice to us all. Uh, and then the second part is an open Q and A. So that's uh, where we will be using the chat function of Zoom to uh, uh, harvest uh, all your questions and then ask uh, some of you to, uh, at that point, um, unmute yourself and uh, come on camera as you see fit to ask your question. Uh, until then though, please stay muted to the extent possible to avoid uh, um, interference with the, with the speaker. And uh, if you have any questions of a more procedural nature, you can also use the chat, which will be monitored by Nell and uh, Vivian in particular, uh, to uh, deal with any questions that may be uh, more technical and so forth. But as we go through the, the, the session, I encourage you to uh, think about questions you'd have for our guests uh, today, and uh, the more the merrier in that respect. All right, so a little bit more about uh, Henrik. Um, for the sake of, uh, of, um, of those who may not be completely familiar with him yet, um, although you will uh, undoubtedly have come across or will come across a lot of his research in your uh, in your uh, in, in time, if you're uh, even if you're an early stage PhD student. Enric is currently a professor of entrepreneurship at INSEAD, where specifically uh, he holds the Rudolf and Valeria Maier Chair in uh, Entrepreneurship. Uh, he's the former head of um, the uh, Department of Entrepreneurship and Family Business and uh, of the Valerie, uh, of the Rudolf and Maria Mike Center for Research in Entrepreneurship, as in said as well. Uh, previously, and this will be part of our discussion down the road, he spent time at the Norwegian School of Management, BI, 
And before that, uh, his first, uh, shall we say, tenure track position was at the University of Tsukuba in, uh, near uh, Tokyo in, uh, in Japan. Uh, before that, he obtained his PhD at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. And we will leave the, before the PhD part for the interview uh, section to, to, to start in a moment. Um, amongst the highlights and amongst the items that I would like to touch on uh, in no particular order today uh, are the fact that uh, Henrik is an experienced uh, editor. Uh, he's currently the editor or editor-in-chief, if you prefer, of ASQ, where he has uh, undertaken various initiatives, two of which I've listed here, one pertaining to graphical uh, evidence uh, reporting and, uh, and its impact. And it's, its role in both quality assurance, but also clarity of, uh, of um, communication. Another uh, is that he introduced, I believe, in one of the first uh, journals in our field was to introduce a methods advisory panel. And I'd like his update and take on, on those initiatives, which date back two or three years, respectively. Um, Henrik's a list of, uh, of awards and, uh, and accolades is too long to, to speak to, but uh, I'll just mention a few. He's, a, of course, an, a, a fellow of the Academy of Management, the, the highest uh, colleague of the Academy itself, or, and which, which he achieved at a, at a relatively uh, young age, if I may say. Uh, I'm not sure if Anne Tsui is on, uh, on, the, uh, on the line right now, but uh, he's also recently the recipient of the uh, uh, research on res uh, Responsible Research uh, in Business and Management Award from ICMR as well as RBM. Um, and has twice been a finalist, uh, or close to winner of the best paper award for AMG, a highly competitive award, as you may imagine. Uh, we, uh, as in our former existence as BPS division, rather than currently SDR or strategic management division, and that in one of our distinguished paper awards uh, some years back. Um, I alluded briefly to his publication record, but he has about 120 publications by now, including 86 articles or annual uh, um, publications, and two books with the third one in, uh, in progress, as I understand it. Um, his research topics, uh, you can discover them on his website. Just uh, search uh, for Henrik's name and you'll, you'll come up with both his INSEAD webpage and uh, his personal webpage pertain to uh, learning from performance feedback and other uh, dimensions of the behavioral theory of the firm, dynamics of interorganizational networks, uh, diffusion of innovations institutions, and more recently misconduct, and other aspects uh, which have gotten him in print, not just in every major journal in our field, uh, but also in the lives of the American Journal of Sociology, the International Economic Review, and uh, quite a, a breadth of uh, of, uh, fields and, uh, as well. Um, he is also, uh, these may be things that we tend to, uh, to underestimate when we see uh, Henrik's uh, prodigious uh, publication record. He's also an active uh, uh, member of uh, the uh, academic community in the, in the sense of organizing events. He's a, he was one of the co-organizers of an SMS special conference. It was held in Oslo uh, two years ago and as a co-organized co uh, when he was an ASQ associate editor, um, some, uh, some workshops uh, <clears throat> that were amongst the pioneers in a generation of new workshops that are, that are extremely helpful to budding scholars and even experienced scholars such as myself who want to really get to meet the editors uh, not just in the context of one PPW at the Academy but uh, over a slightly more extended period and more dedicated to, to developing a manuscript. Uh, and uh, with uh, some grudging respect, I may say, since we are not, we are STR, but he is the former chair of the OMT division of the Academy of Management. And uh, so he has given to the Academy of Management as well. Um, finally, and this is again something that many of you may not be quite as aware of, uh, but he is actually quite a media figure, uh, especially in, uh, in Asia um, at this point, uh, and has. Um, played a role uh, with, through press interviews, uh, work with CNBC. And I encourage you deeply, we'll return to it in a moment, but I encourage you deeply to not only use his website, but peruse from his website, his blog, organizational musing. I'll, ref I'll come back to it later, but it's, uh, I, I find it exemplary reading for the clarity in, in which we can manage as, as scholars to extract 
the deepest insights from uh, from papers, even papers we have not written, which is some level is it's more interesting. And uh, that's that's a craft that uh, every PhD student, amongst other things, should uh, should very much be exposed to. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here, and we'll uh, move now to uh, our uh, uh, the interview part of uh, of this uh, of this event. Um, so, um, Enric, um, uh, we'll, we'll now uh, turn to you and try to understand a bit. We'll start a bit with who you are, and then we'll turn to your scholarship uh, trajectory and, and lessons for, uh, for, for our audience. Uh, but as a starting point, uh, tell us a little bit about where you grew up and uh, what Enric as a, a child was, and, uh, and what, uh, what may have sort of imprinted you in, in, from, uh, from that early uh, from your early years? So I come from uh, Bergen, Norway. Um, that's, well, many of you don't know it, but it's a coastal uh, town or city, we usually call it. Um, I, I think pretty unremarkable uh, childhood in many ways. I mean, the way I grew up, uh, I guess, uh, uh, given that we're going to talk about research, I think you're probably thinking about schools and how was my schooling and things like that. Um, I think my primary school and middle school, the like kind description of them would be that they were unambitious. And that's uh, putting it kindly. Um, but so I didn't really have any inspiring teachers or anything like that until I, I made it to high school. But, um, you know, from then on things uh, improved a bit. It, um, the only odd thing, uh, which I, I thought nothing of at the time, uh, but it's related to research. Um, um, you may know that a lot of places have, um, in middle school, you spend one week working so that you get to see what a workplace is like. Uh, my workplace was a little unusual. I was uh, used as an RA in, um, in a laboratory that dealt with the botanical archeology. span was botanical archaeology. Well, they dig up sediments that are many hundred years ago. In uh, our case, it was a 900 year old. Um, and then um, you put glycerine in them, put them under a strong magnifying glass. And if you have a, a young uh, RA, it picks up the seed for others to uh, identify. Uh, so 900 year old sediment in Norway means uh, Viking age uh, and because we're mainly used interested in what people were eating um, the sediment came from well a toilet uh, so that was uh, my earliest scientific work um, I was the first person ever to have found um, a grape stone in uh, in Norway from the Viking age uh, fascinating, Henrik, and I think I think we'll we'll allude later to some of your ideas being uh, being inspired by by the uh, by the scientific process in the, in the outside social science. Maybe maybe already that uh, the idea that would lead to your current uh, ASQ policies uh, was coming into into literally into view, if I may say. Um, wonderful. So uh, tell us another thing that's that's uh, that's uh, on some level important. If you have not become a, um, a senior professor of, of management. Um, growing up, what would you have imagined that I didn't really have any career plans of any sort, except that um, I, I did okay at school in my um, at high school, um, and the best nearby school for somebody like me would be. Uh, actually either uh, the local med school or uh, or business school uh, that's in Bergen. Um, and it happened to be that I hadn't thought well enough about it, so I didn't exactly take the electives I needed to go to med school. So unlike some of my friends, uh, I applied for business school instead. So there's a piece of randomness there. But anyway, I ended up uh, with an undergraduate business degree. Um, and uh, finishing school there, I knew that I had uh, uh, to serve in the military afterwards, uh, which I'd postponed. You're supposed to do that. Um, 
um, when you're 18, but um, there were too many people at the time. So then I had to think about, you know, what do I do next? And, you know, from that kind of background, there's a variety of options. Uh, um, applying for a PhD program was just one of them. Interesting. So uh, before we get to the PhD program, uh, uh, on some level, you, 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 you implied that you, that you um, selected for business because it was, uh, it was one, of the, uh, one of the best uh, programs around, but you didn't necessarily have, have an advanced idea. Who were some of your, your inspirations growing up, um, both to your career and, and, and more broadly? Hmm. Um, really nothing. I mean, I, uh, it's really just a, a group of friends who shared ideas about what do we do, uh, what are our, um, the kind of things we want to do in life. But of course, we, uh, we inspired each other in many ways, but we were also at the same time so different that we ended up doing very different things. Um, in fact, uh, the, the main thing that almost prevented me from going to um, the, the PhD program was that the three of us, uh, we'd been doing, uh, all of us were computer programmers, um, which we'd learned uh, not at the university, but just on our own. And we'd worked as subcontractors for a software firm, uh, done pretty well. Uh, so we thought maybe we should just form a company. Uh, but in order to do that, I mean, subcontract to sell ours, which is nothing worthwhile doing. So we need a good product idea. And we spent a fair amount of time coming up with and rejecting product ideas. And uh, finally, we decided, no, we're not going to do that. We will we'll go each our own way, which I think was a good choice because we've all done well in different directions afterwards. That's, that's an even better again. I guess we, we see here the, the seeds of science and entrepreneurship already in, the, in these early years, even though they may not have uh, come together. I guess where they start to come together for you is probably like for many of us during the, during the PhD. So tell us about the, the step uh, across, uh, across the ocean and across the continent, literally, uh, that got you into, uh, into, uh, into the PhD program, which uh, as I alluded earlier, you did your PhD at Stanford's uh, Graduate School of Business. Um, we'll get to the uh, supervision side later, but for now, how did you end up deciding that you wanted to do a PhD after your studies, which were undergraduates in business? Um, specifically, how did you end up uh, at Stanford? And uh, um, we'll, we'll allude to that later, but how did, uh, how did these early sort of decisions come together? Um, the, uh, there's, there's a tendency for people to think, uh, oh, there's a deep connection, which uh, some of you may be aware of by a, a so-called Scantcore program between, mm -hmm. between uh, 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 Norway and other Nordic countries of Europe and, uh, and Stanford, but it's, it was probably not a foregone idea that that was the place to go, uh, given your interests and so forth. But tell us about this process. So really the... Um... The software enterprise was one of the options we were looking at. Um, uh, the other one was, I mean, I like most people who had done okay at that business school, I had an, a job offer from, um, in my case, it was from uh, what was then called Anderson Consulting, now better known as Accenture. Uh, I was unimpressed with, uh, with the pay they offered. Um, so, you know, I thought about it, but it wasn't that appealing. Um, and then there was the option that I knew of that I could apply for a PhD program, which would be a totally safe option because I was going to be in the military anyway. So I would just need to wait to see um, whether I got in or not. And um, I had actually been used as a TA, um, in fact, in managerial accounting. And I had had a lot of fun teaching. Uh, you, you teach to the students are one year below you just do problem solving exercise. Um, fantastically fun, but not something that I would be able to do unless I, you know, did this thing to get a PhD. So, uh, which I understood needed some research also. And, and I'd actually tried my hand uh, with a little bit more advanced RA work for one of the local professors. Um, he needed to to have the simulation software uh, made, which I did. 
So, so those were the little pieces of inspiration. And then the uh, offers from uh, schools came in while I was still in the service. Um, applied to four schools, came into three. Wasn't sure which one to choose, but a lot of people were saying that Stanford was a good place to go, so I should pick that one. Oh, was it? Uh, was it? Uh, what did your friends and family uh, were they? Were they? Were they expecting this? Uh, this? This direction and this choice in your life? It came a little bit as a shock, especially uh, to my father, who was actually a professor at the time, uh, and who <laughs> didn't really think that I would do anything like that. Uh, but uh, he he could deal with it. Yes, uh, indeed. Um, so from there, uh, pretty early on, and we'll, we'll get uh, shortly to your trajectory, to your PhD trajectory, which was which was short and effective, uh, to, to mm -hmm. put it mildly. Uh, from there, uh, once you start a PhD, of course, the coursework uh, comes in a different level, shall we say, than typically undergraduate coursework, of course. And then you need to eventually settle on a topic, a supervisor, uh, in no particular mm -hmm. order, depending upon the, the school. Uh, Stanford is, is quite, a, quite a, a, an entrepreneurial school from that standpoint. Tell me about the process of, uh, of identifying your research topic and uh, setting up your committee. So the process um, when I was there, and I suppose it might be the same now, is um, and uh, just each student has to come up with ideas and, and present them to whatever is the nearest uh, interest faculty member, which, um, you know, it's a lot of maneuvering because uh, just accepting me as a student doesn't mean that the school as a whole takes any responsibility for me. I'm, I still have to do the footwork, and, and so I did. Um, so I had a various interests. I was a bit interested in labor mobility and, and the employment relation. Uh, I spent a fair amount of time with uh, Mike Cannon and, and Jim Barron uh, talking about that, and it ended up being a paper. Um, I also had some ideas about um, uh, a little bit, they were direct, uh, what can I say? They were uh, connected to institutional theory, which was a big deal at the time everywhere, but especially at, at Stanford. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I had a bit of a disagreement with institutional theory um, because uh, what was studied as mimetic isomorphism, which proves that something is an institution, I thought that sounds almost right, but not completely, because strategies can also be imitated, and that's they're not institutions, they're strategies. <laughs> and, and so, you know, where do you go to do something that is related to institutional theory, in fact, inspired by it, but a little bit oppositional. Um, but it, the solution was quite easy because I had already been pulled into the, the orbit of uh, Jim March. Um, he had his weekly seminars lots of fantastic speakers, and I loved the questions that he asked of the speaker. So I, I lobbied uh, a fair amount, and he, uh, he finally took me as a student. So, so yes, and Jim March was, was notoriously selective in, in, the, in the students he worked with. Uh, what, what topic did you bring to him, and, and how did your topic evolve over the, this, this critical period when, when you settled in working with Jim? So it was <clears throat> the topic of um, really understanding uh, the diffusion of things that are very important to firms, uh, strategies and related things. Uh, really uh, uh, making a study that would be very similar in to what the institutional isomorphism studies that, that, that was so popular at the time looked like, except that what I studied would be so obviously wrong. Uh, because it is something that uh, the life of a company depends on. So it, it can't be that they're doing it 
because it's just an institution that they are adding on uh, because it's not something they care about. In fact, they imitate because they care. That was, uh, that was what I brought to him um, as, as an idea. And uh, I, I had written uh, what I thought was a very beautiful theory piece uh, before the, the final meeting. And um, he looked at that theory uh, piece um, and, and listened to my presentation of, with all my big theoretical goals. And uh, I think he had a two sentence response. Go to the library, get some data, meeting over. <laughs> Uh, so I went to the library and I got some data. I, uh, in fact, right after my meeting with him, I went to the reference section in the library and I looked at various industries where I could possibly study this, um, alphabetically, in fact. Um, I know that it sounds like I came to solution quickly because I, I studied broadcasting. Uh, but it was classified under radio and television broadcasting. I had come to R and then I found my industry. Well, so quite a, quite a, a challenge working through, the, through this. Now, another aspect of things that uh, may not be obvious when, when people peruse your, uh, your CV is you, you graduated uh, um, with, uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, what is now known as NHH in, in Bergen in 1989. You graduated with your PhD just about five years later, but in between, you alluded to it briefly, you served uh, more than a year in the, in the Norwegian military doing your, your national service. That means that you conduct, completed your entire PhD um, in four years, which, uh, although it was maybe a bit less rare then than, uh, than now, it is still uh, quite a feat, but uh, uh, even more so given how well the work that uh, was included in that, in that dissertation that you just outlined and that being published with uh, at least uh, two and I believe maybe even three top publications coming out uh, in short order. How did you organize yourself as a PhD uh, uh, past such, uh, such uh, as the research stage for a top PhD or supervisor? How do you organize yourself to so effectively get your PhD done, but not only done, but done generating top quality research? I never really thought about it much except that I wanted to, I mean, I didn't want any delays. Uh, I, I knew that most people, I mean, almost everybody uh, graduated in five years and some did in six, but uh, uh, formally it was four years in those days too. Um, I, I guess I was fortunate in one way because there's something called uh, Stanford Center of Organizational Research, which was uh, led by um, Dick Scott, uh, author of the famous textbook. Um, uh, they actually gave me a small uh, grant for the data collection. And um, knowing you know, computers reasonably well, I knew that I could uh, get data from um, from documents uh, very easily uh, do OCR scanning and uh, um, an error checking of them. Uh, I think I was the first one ever to do that at the business school at least. Uh, so the data collection was actually uh, really fast. Uh, the other things, I, I don't think I was much faster in, in doing things having to do with theory. Um, than, than the students who were around me. Just uh, executing the empirics was relatively easy. As a programmer, you know, statistical software isn't difficult if, if you've been a programmer. Um, and, and data collection is also the way I organized it turned out to be relatively easy. It requires a little bit of um, discipline. Um, I think you know that the performance feedback uh, research came out in 1998, and it's data that's highly related to my dissertation data. In fact, I discovered it while I was collecting the data for my dissertation. Um, I even got it coded, and I did two things. One was a simple promise to myself not to touch that data 
until I was actually in paid employment. Uh, so I, I didn't even look at it while I was a student. Uh, the other one was uh, advice from Jim March. Uh, I did not tell the other uh, members of my committee that I had that data uh, because he predicted they would certainly ask me to do something with them in my dissertation and I'd be better off not uh, because that would slow me down. So I followed his advice, of course. Well, the, the, the uh, exemplary focus, as it were. So tell us about the very last stage of the PhD before we move on to uh, one fascinating, fascinating period of your, your life, post PhD. Uh, so you told us about one of your first meetings with, uh, with Jim March and, and that last, uh, that two sentence uh, uh, answer to, uh, to, to, to uh, which steered you really on the way to your dissertation as you alluded to and, and beyond, right? Uh, since you were already had two uh, this station's worth of data uh, in, in relatively short order. Um, what would have been Jim's parting words at your PhD defense? And in general, what did you take away from, from Jim as a, as a mentor and supervisor? Well, uh, that's almost uh, too much to even uh, for me to fully understand because uh, he his advice uh, was really wide. I mean, conversations with him uh, about theory always led to me doubting and then fixing whatever I was doing theoretically. Um, his, um, the dissertation wasn't just me finding that industry and, uh, and uh, then collecting uh, data in the library. As soon as I told him about the data and that it seemed like good data, um, he gave me a list of three names of broadcasters and told me that I should call them, say that um, I knew him and I should do a qualitative study. Uh, naturally not for publication because um, I had no skills uh, needed for that, uh, but I needed to know the industry uh, before studying it. Fantastic advice and I've followed it every, uh, ever since. Uh, always know the industry um, and if you're like me, and don't try to publish the things you do to learn the industry. Uh, publish the more rigorous stuff in, instead. Um, he was even, um, this is something that people won't connect to him, but a fairly politically astute um, advisor. Uh, I mean, I had come into the business school with an entirely wrong skill set. I mean, somebody who um, programs computers and knows very little about the social sciences outside of business, uh, wasn't really great fit for uh, the doctor program the way it was there. And, and so I, I had to touch various bases in order to become accepted. And uh, he, you know, he pointed to where each of those bases were and uh, just what I needed to do. And so I, I went through those steps uh, uh, pretty effectively. Uh, we we got a grade um, um, after each year of being a student there. At um, my first year, I got the lowest grade that would uh, keep me there as a student. So just one, you know, just one step above failing, and then my grade increased by one step for each year. So that was Jim's responsibility. So uh, one last point on, on Jim, uh, the, the, the field of strategy, the field of social science, in fact, humanity lost, lost Jim about a year and a half ago now. Um, you, um, what, what would you say as, as one of, uh, of Jim's uh, students, there are, there are quite a few others, of course, but what would you say you took away from this in terms of your own approach to um, identifying research questions and, and also to supervising uh, uh, students or, or working with others? So the big picture takeaway um, <clears throat> for me was that, um, you know, you, sh you should just let the curiosity um, lead uh, to, to the research questions. There's no need to be fixed on an agenda or anything like that. Uh, just 
you know, if something looks interesting, pursue it. I mean, that was the way he always uh, did research. Um, I, I think he's been asked a number of times, doesn't this piece of your research slightly have a slight inconsistency with this other piece? And, and he would say, I mean, yes, sure. Um, that's not really a problem. Uh, you know, the world is, is complicated and uh, we often end up with, with things like that. It, it actually makes sense. Uh, that's the big picture. Uh, the, um, uh, the smaller picture, of course, is that um, even within the, the closest range of theory that he works with, which would be behavioral theory firm or learning theory, it's actually a, it's, it's a quite broad range of ideas and approaches for studying organizations and uh, organizational actors that engage in strategy, engage in entrepreneurship. And so it's, it's a toolbox that's never empty. Um, and that um, gives fantastic flexibility as a researcher, especially if you're of the curious kind uh, who just likes to find problems and uh, theoretical problems or empirical problems and solve them. Yeah. So, so indeed, he, I, I guess he didn't know how to, to get the best out of his students like, uh, like he did. Um, so let's move on, if, you, if we may, to, to your post AG trajectory. And here for our audience, I'd like to to, uh, to interject a bit of a, of a, of a background. Um, many of you, uh, especially if you're at the PhD stage or otherwise at a critical juncture in your life, may be wondering market with the, uh, due, due to COVID and, uh, and the ensuing uh, economic situation. And amongst the questions I frequently get from PhD students at uh, consortia nowadays, uh, for instance, should I be willing to take a temporary position? Uh, should I be willing to take, to go to the type of places, uh, maybe far abroad where I would not normally have, uh, have expected to, to be, to be uh, taking a job down the road? So um, although the motivation in your case, Henrik, was, uh, was quite different, fundamentally the, the mechanics are not necessarily different. So um, uh, shortly upon, uh, upon my graduation, uh, the first thing you did was take on not one, but actually a sequence of two visiting positions, uh, all within one school year, uh, on two different continents. You uh, spent uh, some time uh, at uh, uh, KU University and then returned to uh, Bergen, Norway, where you spent the rest of your first academic year after your PhD. Um, and yet, uh, if I may say, because many of us would expect that to be a, a rather distracting or, or costly endeavor, uh, within three years of your PhD, you had uh, published uh, three papers, a single authored in ASQ, a single authored paper in SMJ, and a paper in AJS, uh, enough for many schools to, uh, to, be, uh, to be absolutely enchanted with the outcome. So tell us first, how did you manage uh, to uh, remain your focus, to retain your focus, uh, stay abreast of research and so forth, while making that unusual uh, two-step uh, <coughs> uh, period uh, in your first year where you were essentially waiting for a job, even though you might easily have gotten uh, attractive offers elsewhere. I'll, I'll return to that later. So I think... Um, uh, Part of uh, the, the two things uh, going on there. One was um, I had a storage of things I wanted to do, but I hadn't had time to do them during the PhD program because there was this big thing, this big distraction during the P program, PhD program, you know, called the dissertation that needed to be done, and and that one just took up all the time. And so spinning out articles from the dissertation and then doing the other ideas that I'd had, but couldn't do because I had to focus on dissertation. I, I just had to unspool the whole thing. Uh, so I, I had plenty of things to do. And um, uh, 
I didn't have much distractions because I worked uh, alone on everything, on nearly everything that I was doing at the time, which also suits me um, quite well. I mean, people are, are different. I, I know that I'm not by nature uh, very collaborative. I, I do collaborate, uh, but that's typically because uh, I, I need somebody else to join in with something. I mean, we we create something as a group. Um, but uh, in my early work, uh, nearly all of it was just all me. And it's still the case that if I if I get a pet idea and um, uh, there is a high likelihood that I'm just going to keep it for myself. All right, and that's I'm not saying it's a good thing, but I'm saying that it's it's uh, people are different, and, um, and that is actually pretty convenient if you're moving around because I'm moving with me, and there are no conversations that have to be uh, stopped and started again. And 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 so again to, for for the for the for the, uh, for the education and inspiration in particular of, of our of our junior participants in the, in this session, um, you then made something that for someone who already was well on their way to to having multiple uh, top publications and had a, a tremendous uh, pedigree, you then went and took your first uh, shall we call it tenure track but anyway so called Definitely prominent job. Um, the, the the boy from Bergen, after having spent time in, in California, now goes and takes his first job at the University of Tsukuba, some uh, about an hour's uh, train ride away from uh, from from Tokyo. Again, you had uh, personal reasons of, of some nature for this, but one would expect that taking a job of this nature can be. Uh, is it, not necessarily the type of place where you'll get plenty of supporting scholars to do your work, um, plenty of, uh, of uh, opportunities to meet with visiting scholars uh, from, uh, say, the US or others who would have been highly influential, meet editors, and so forth. Uh, so, how did you manage to keep yourself uh, productive uh, to, in fact, accelerate your pipeline? past those early years, including that second project that you started to collect data on, on performance feedback, but that still would have to be written up uh, in, in a quick three years. <clears throat> that by 1999, you were adding yet another ASQ, uh, another single author publication, you were accelerating, even though you had, uh, you were at your third school in three years and uh, we're now at a school which very few of us would expect to be sort of, uh, a great place to, to obtain support for this type of research. I mean, you're, <clears throat> you're right. Um, uh, being in, in, in the school in, in Japan, there's a certain amount of loneliness there. And uh, being in an economics department, there's uh, even more loneliness uh, for somebody with my training. Um, didn't really have somebody who's would be good to talk to or develop research um, with until uh, my colleague uh, Hitoshi Mitsushi was hired uh, a few years after I had joined. Uh, we ended up working together naturally. Um, what was behind it? Um, <clears throat> I don't, um, I mean, I think a lot of what takes up time is the publication process, at least it is for many uh, scholars. And um, I had been uh, lucky enough to find theoretical problems that I was working on that uh, caught the interest of, of journalists. So I saved a, a great deal of time on that. Uh, and, uh, and I had invested in data collection that meant that the data I had were just um, but I'm, I'm pretty picky and it certainly persuaded me and there were no real uh, pushback from the reviewers either in terms of what the data were like. Uh, some about how I, I talked about it, I made the theory, but in, in general, the, the review process uh, was uh, better than what I, I know 
it was for many of my peers at the same time. So I, I, in a way, I had found a sweet spot, um, which is which is interesting because uh, the first line of research I did on diffusion, I was really just being institutional, but a bit rebellious in, in how I I did the work. Um, I mean, there is no such thing as, as institutional theory of strategy adoption. Um, at least, I don't think there is. Uh, but that was the topic of one of my first papers. Um, I'm not quite phrased that way. Um, and uh, performance feedback uh, is really two pages uh, in a book that was um, more than 30 years old at the time. It's just that it hadn't been um, used uh, the way that I used it, even though it was literally written on the page how to do such a study, it's just that it hadn't been done. Uh, so that also hit uh, a sweet spot because people understood that uh, this, this could actually be important. Um, I, I'm not going to claim that I have any <laughs> extreme work habits or anything like that, because I, I think I don't. Um, uh, but those particular papers had appeal. I mean, fascinating, clearly uh, an exemplary to, to, for, the, for the ability to, uh, to, to work uh, without sort of the institutional support that we, that we grow to, to pride as the, as the prime uh, purpose of many, many job searches. One more question on that, and then uh, now maybe we can uh, we can uh, we can move on to, to taking a, a good picture. But one more question on that: um, you you would be uh, certainly uh, very understandable if, if you don't remember that. But the first time we met, actually, uh, Henrik, uh, was uh, I believe in the summer of 1993 or 1994. Um, mm -hmm. I believe it's, it might well have been 1994, just before you graduated. I was I had a sort of managed to uh, maneuver myself into a, a workshop of the Colleges of Organizational Science uh, that was held at, um, at Stanford, uh, featuring uh, the likes of Dan Carroll and then Bill Barnett, who were running the methods workshops. I don't know if you remember that. But the more important point about this that I want to make is this last point, which is one that those of you who are still thinking about your options might either not have thought about or if you've thought about be very concerned about. Much of the discussion uh, in informal uh, meetings I had to, to a chance to, to, uh, to participate in or eavesdrop um, with these uh, distinguished faculty at Stanford was where is Henrich, where is Henrich uh, going? Uh, why is, you know, he, he, he has the caliber, he could easily get a job, but uh, MIT, uh, Chicago, Harvard, all the type of schools that, uh, that Stanford uh, clearly tries to, to, to place people at. And frankly, many of us would be afraid of going to our supervisor and telling them, no, that's not my path. I'm going to take my own path geographically in terms of institutions and, and so forth. So tell us how you manage that. And uh, by the way, the answer, uh, the reaction of the people that uh, at Stanford, this, this senior faculty was extremely, um, extremely sound and and, uh, and and meaningful. But but how did you manage that uh, that part of, uh, of building your own trajectory? So, I mean, I thought the trajectory was pretty clear, at least according to how I organized my uh, life. Um, I wanted to spend at least the beginning of it. Um, um, working at either in my home country or, or the home country of my then wife because we had um, uh, children who needed to be erased uh, with the correct language. So it's not that complicated, uh, at least if you, uh, if you have a value system like mine. Um, in terms of career risks, um, I, I never, um, I don't think I thought too much about it. In fact, uh, the only time that I really um, had an appreciation of um, the career risk that I had overcome, uh, it's actually uh, when I was at the University of Tsukuba and I, um, I received um, 
the second acceptance letter from ASQ, which was one of my dissertation papers. And uh, I looked at the letter and I said, well, now I have two, this is my letter of freedom. Now I can do research on any topic I want. And I literally thought it was a letter of freedom. Fascinating. And so in a sense, it, it came a bit earlier than maybe it would have if you had gone to, to some other schools in time. All right, uh, now shall we take a, a group picture now? I'll let you take over. Yeah, so um, for as many of you that are willing to turn on your cameras, it would be great to actually see you. And uh, apart from that, you can smile, you can make a funny face. I won't, I won't make any other requests. <laughs> Okay, smile guys. I've taken two just as a backup um, and these will be posted online and also in the newsletter. That's it, we can continue. Very good, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, with this short uh, interlude, uh, I'd like to rather quickly move on to, uh, to your, uh, your research and, and a few more things, a few more things that I think you've done that many of us would be uh, not necessarily find uh, find easy to do. So a, a couple more things about yourself. As you as your, uh, you, you said you you gained your letter of freedom. You you were you had been impressed by by Jim's sort of breadth underneath the consistency of his framework, and that also shows in your research evidently. Um, but a couple of things about about positioning, so to speak. Again, all the more given that you were off center, shall we say, relative to to the. Uh, to the uh, traditional uh, uh, center of the, uh, of the, of the uh, uh, organization studies and, and strategy universe. Um, you, uh, if, we, if people peruse your CV, your, your primary interest in, uh, is in, uh, in, the, uh, in the management of strategic change, so strategy effectively, uh, but you're, you state your, your main teaching interest as organization theory and you are a professor of entrepreneurship. Uh, that too is a, is a breadth that uh, that although it can, tends to come with seniority, uh, not everyone uh, is, uh, is is necessarily uh, always uh, always uh, interested or, or or able to 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 fathom. So tell us how how you think of this nexus between strategy, organization research, organization theory, and uh, and entrepreneurship, and and how has it sort of uh, evolved in your in your research pipeline over the years. So this uh, goes straight back to um, Jim March and, and really his big picture thinking about how uh, to think of research. Um, it, it's actually related to a very common career advice that people get also. And, and now I'm going to say something contrary. So let me uh, preface that by saying that. Um, uh, one of the best advice that you can get uh, from a senior professor these days is to not listen too much to advice from senior professors uh, because the world has changed and because we're all different. Um, so it's not clear that uh, what fits me fits other people. But anyway, um, the uh, I. Uh, people often say that you're supposed to uh, create an identity for yourself and the research should be focused. So it's very clear what you are about um, as a researcher. And, um, and I think that's useful because it's a way of easily explaining who you are to the world and to people you meet and so on. Uh, but there has a cost like everything does. Um, the cost is actually that you lose some freedom. Uh, because you have to uh, act according to that identity. And uh, I've, thanks to Jim Marge's influence, I think in part, I'm not willing to give up much freedom at all. And so I've never really worried about where my research positioned me and whether it looked consistent at all. In fact, I, I graduated um, with my PhD and publications in um, SMJ in sociological methodology and research 
and in uh, Acta Sociologica, uh, which was a paper on uh, labor mobility. So I was the uh, strategy and methodology and labor mobility scholar who had unpublished dissertation on organizational change as a result of diffusion. I'll try to make sense of that. Um, and it's actually worked out pretty well. Uh, I think part of the reason that it, it works, again, again, draw the lines back to uh, the way I was trained. Uh, and both the training that Jim gave and the things that I read in addition, because we, we trained ourselves quite a bit. Um, it's a big toolkit that has to do with how organizations learn and change themselves. And that theoretical toolkit has a lot of implications in different directions. It has things to do with the strategies they're going to make. It has things to do with um, new enterprise creation. It has things to do with how they treat their employees, how they treat their, their customers. It just reaches in all directions. Um, and so you, you can learn that and have an identity and be consistent, but you can also jump around the way that, that I have. And um, I've been fairly conscious about not telling people what my identity is. I'll try to make them discover that on their own. So different people will have different ideas about it, but that simplifies things from my point of view. Well, again, again, quite, uh, quite uh, uh, straightforward, and, uh, but also courageous, a courageous take on things that I think indeed is contrary to, to, to much uh, conventional advice. Um, one, uh, one area that, uh, that you are uh, identified to, I, I, I dare to say it's probably the, the, uh, the, the bulk of your research, although indeed you're published in, uh, in multiple uh, areas, is the behavioral theory of the firm. And furthermore, you've published uh, some influential uh, reviews and editorials about this. And of course, it is uh, the brainchild of, uh, of Jim March as well as uh, Dick Sire. Um, so let me, let me uh, probe you a little bit on uh, your take on uh, developing such a theory. You alluded already to the fact that you were amongst the first to come up with data and, uh, and a framework for testing one of the core premises of um, behavioral theory, which is uh, performance feedback, and which has become a, a mainstream topic, uh, I, I would say, in, in strategy and organization uh, research. Uh, but, uh, but more broadly, there's more, of course, more to, to Jim March and to, to the behavioral theory of the firm, the, the book itself and, uh, and, uh, and the theory. Um, uh, in an inspiring speech back in uh, 2016, I think that he held, uh, not surprisingly perhaps, at INSEAD, uh, Jim March listed a, a series of six uh, topics, uh, which goes beyond that. Garbage can is one of them. Uh, 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 research or organizational uh, learning or failure to learn from experience, uh, ambiguity, uh, exploration, exploitation. So there, it's, it's quite a broad, uh, a, broad uh, a broad topic in general. What do you sort of perceive and what do you see as the, as, as the boundaries of the behavioral theory of the firm first and behavioral strategy perhaps uh, more broadly since you were also one of the founders of the behavioral strategy interest group of the academy, of, of the SMS as it were? So I think um, I, I, th those boundaries uh, typically end up being a little bit artificial. I, um, I often refer to uh, everything that's been treated relatively systematically in the 1963 book as the behavioral theory of the firm. Um, uh, but there's a fair number of other things that go beyond that, which is learning theory, obviously inspired by it, but it is bigger and is different. Um, so it, it's hard to tell where one ends and, and something else uh, begins. Uh, I think the main ideas about learning and about the way that experience uh, influences organizations, along with these organizational procedures, such as uh, decision-making involving multiple people, um, routines, um, 
treating information in groups and passing it on. There's, there's uh, a lot of things that we haven't fully explored yet and that we actually have new tools for uh, dealing with. Um, I, I know that uh, I, I'm beginning to recognize my limitations. I, I know I have to stop before the rest of the people uh, listening to uh, to this session have to stop. Um, uh, one of, for example, um, there's a chapter in the Behavioral Theater Firm on coalition making and, and politics and organizations. And that chapter isn't really a solution. That chapter presents a problem and gives a good illustration of why that theoretical problem is difficult. That's very unlike the performance feedback where the solution is actually in the book. Um, and so that's an interesting topic. Uh, another issue that you, you see various places in, in the book and even more later work is that organizations act and they talk and, um, and just as the institutionalists discovered with, uh, with Meyer and Rowan, uh, the consistency of those state two things uh, over time or even at the same time isn't necessarily all that great. And, and so it's actually interesting to uh, think more about the relationship between organizational action and organizational talk. And this is something that we are beginning to get data on and analysis of, although it, what's been done so far to me looks fairly simple, uh, but it has a long way to go. So these are just examples of where there's a really old book, um, but there are ideas in it that can just keep flowing into more research for you know, a decade or two more, uh, definitely. So you would say read, read and reread the behavioral theory firm, which, which certainly is, a, is never wasted advice on, on a PhD student or even a, a more, mm -hmm. more advanced uh, scholar indeed. Um, another aspect of this, uh, so uh, uh, with the 50th anniversary of the, of the publication of the behavioral theory firm in uh, around 2013. You were involved more recently with the passing of, of Jim Mark. There have been articles uh, from uh, some of his uh, students and, uh, and, uh, and fellow uh, road travelers, so to speak. Uh, one of them, um, Linda Argotti, in a, in a, in a, in a you know, sort of a, a review of, a, of, the, of the future of the behavioral theory of the firm in which you also participated, Linda Argotti made, made a, uh, a provocative statement uh, which, uh, which, which uh, should also be of interest to, to behavioral strategy researchers. She, she alluded to, to the fact that the micro-macro linkage that is uh, quite central to creating a theory at the organizational level from, uh, from individual actors is something that she deemed to be, uh, to be maybe a bit less well-developed in the, in, the, in the literature. Is that also your take? Mm -hmm. and, and in general, how would you sort of tackle such complex issues. You've already alluded to the issues of, of, uh, of uh, tackling conflict and, and that essential part of the, of the framework. But this micro to macro linkage is, is, if, is if anything, even more foundational uh, to, to the assumptions of the theory. So I think uh, one of the things that uh, at least I have taken uh, out of research like that, and it's not just the behavior of theater firm, I mean the book, uh, but also similar research. Um, <clears throat> making those linkages across levels of analysis is uh, a non-trivial problem, especially because uh, how the links function depends on what is the organization engaged in, what is it doing at the moment. And so, um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I know there's a lot to talk about micro foundations and maybe some people also talk about meso foundations of, of, of things. Um, I don't think there can be such a thing as a generalized um, either micro foundation or a generalized way of linking the levels of analysis whatever is done, if it is done across levels of analysis, it has to be specific to the particular theory that, um, that is being developed. I mean, what is the theory of a problem? Uh, depending on what that is, uh, you know, find a solution. 
um, and, and maybe this this was a little sounds a little bleaker than uh, it, it should be, but I, I really think that um, one of the good ways of avoiding uh, waste of time is to uh, to set a fairly narrow scope when we make theory, because then it gets specific and it, it gets to work. So uh, I guess the, the, the hurdle uh, re remains, but 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 uh, but indeed that's uh, that's consistent with with what we observed in your in your research. Now for our audience here, I'd like to to sort of take a, a side minute to mention we're we're getting uh, quite along here. We have just a few more minutes of the interviewing part of this uh, of this conversation to to go. I encourage you to start uh, as you've heard about uh, Henrik, the person about his general and some of these research advices or you transpired, I encourage you to start um, using the chat function under Zoom, I think in the center bottom of your, uh, your screen, to start uh, asking questions that we can uh, um, then ask you in, in turn to, to ask of, uh, of Jim or otherwise to answer if, uh, if there are too many offline. But I encourage you to start the first, uh, this, the first conference, uh, so to speak, in terms of uh, getting your questions answered by, by Henrik while he's uh, still with us for this uh, long evening for him. So, uh, Henrik, just a couple more things about research and then we'll move on to uh, briefly talk about, uh, about your, your experience as an editor. Uh, two, two things that uh, people may not know as much about you. Uh, one is you have uh, published uh, two, and uh, it's, I suspect it's knowing you soon, uh, three books. I'm, I'm, in fact, I'll hold one of them up here uh, to the to the camera. Oh, I guess my, uh, I, I think the background will uh, labor it. But anyway, this is your uh, your first book, uh, 2003, Organizational Learning from Performance Feedback. You then published a slightly more applied book uh, from uh, on uh, on networks, uh, together with um, with a couple of your uh, of your INSEAD uh, colleagues that I remember. And you are now working on uh, another book with uh, Pino Odia again on the topic of performance feedback, this time with multiple goals, which could be quite a departure from, uh, from even your own uh, sort of uh, implementation or, or, or uh, uh, of, of the theory uh, in your early work at least. What's, what's been the role of books in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in, in the development of your trajectory, especially for someone like you who's known to be uh, tremendously productive in, in publishing in, in uh, uh, articles and who certainly has no trouble getting your work into journals when you decide to. So what's the role of books and uh, what's the takeaway for, for you in terms of uh, publishing what has been in your case uh, about a book every 10 years? Well, uh, I might as well admit it uh, that I would never have published a first book or, or tried to uh, if it hadn't been that too much told me to. Um, I, he, that that was the thing to do at this time. He just said, write a book. And uh, I, it, it, it's beginning to sound like I do everything he says. I, I, I've done roughly half of the things he's told me to, uh, but I've typically had a pretty good judgment of which ones to, to do and which ones to not do. And the book works fantastically. Um, what he realized uh, and I understood I guess while writing the book or shortly after publishing it, is that uh, books uh, sort of uh, leave a record of where the research is, both in theory and in, uh, in empirics at a certain period of time. And, uh, and the theoretical record is actually the more important one because all the things that they will not let you put into an article the things that are very useful for helping others develop their own empirical uh, research based on these ideas, they can go into the book. Uh, so uh, I think you see why, because articles, uh, you typically give information that would be useful for replication, uh, and then you try to make them short. So you have information useful for replication, but you don't give information that's useful for extension. Um, in books, you can do all of that. And, and so um, it's just, it's a bit to promote, but it's much more to leave ideas out there for others to take. And, uh, and that's what the, that book was about. Uh, in the new book, uh, which 
we're hoping to publish um, uh, is of the same kind. It's just full of things that the two of us will have no chance of testing, but we think they're all reasonable propositions. Of course, we're happy to be proven wrong. Um, it serves the same purpose to stimulate thought and testing an idea. Uh, so, um, uh, we'll, we'll move back to journals, if you don't mind, in the interest of time. Uh, questions are beginning to come in the chat, but I encourage you again to, to keep uh, uh, adding questions for, uh, uh, for, for Jim or Jess, for first, Jim, sorry, for, we're, we're alluding to Jim, my apologies to Henrik, uh, first. Uh, um, uh, questions are beginning to come in, thank you, keep them coming. Uh, let's now move on to, to your, uh, your role and your experiences and as an editor. I should mention that before you were, became the editor-in-chief of, uh, of ASQ, you were an, a senior editor for organization science and an associate editor for a title at, uh, at ASQ. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, and in the interest of, of time, uh, ASQ is, is quite a, a special journal in many ways. I, I'll allude to that in a moment. But let's start with your take as an editor, in particular the two initiatives you've taken the most obviously, to my knowledge, you 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 uh, you uh, the ASQ blog includes a video where you where you where you look to, to these two. Uh, but um, one pertains to improving evidence for presentation, and here I suspect that this early uh, experience uh, uh, with uh, biology uh, 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 may 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 not be completely uh, completely. Uh, uh, separate from, from the inspiration. So tell us about the inspiration for this. Tell us, for, for those of you in the audience who may not be as attuned to this, uh, this starts, it started back in 1997, I believe. Um, we will be missing, uh, I suspect this year, the, uh, the annual uh, PDW at the Academy of Management, where, uh, where these ideas get uh, further than advanced and, and shared more widely. But tell us about the inspiration for this. Uh, and uh, at the three-year point, so to speak, what is your takeaway from, from this initiative? So um, the initiative on, on showing data really is uh, it's born out of reading across uh, a number of fields of research and uh, no small measure of embarrassment because um, uh, if, if you're used to some other fields near uh, management, uh, and, and then you read one of our normal journal articles, it's almost as if we, uh, it's very important for us to conceal the data uh, because you see nothing of the data at all in a normal article. You see an analysis, but analysis is not data. Analysis is something that you get out of processing the data. And then you see some graphs with predictions, but predictions are not data either. Uh, so you read an entire article and there is no data at display. Um, now, is that harmful in any way? I think it is in a couple of ways. Uh, it harms the author in the sense that um, there are many appealing ways of just showing one simple graph, a nice phenomenon here that we can explain. Just show something that happens in the data to catch the, the reader's attention. Um, I mean, part of the initiative I've done in ASQ, and, and I've been pushing my associate editors on this, not just announcing it uh, to, to the academy, uh, is wouldn't it be great to have an article with a striking graph of the phenomenon in the introduction of the article, not later than that? That would be a way for the uh, the author to really um, show what they they have. Uh, of course, there are also other things. I mean, showing good data distributions that show the relation between the independent and dependent variable without any control variables at all. Um, if you can show that there is a relation before you've done your regression, then the regression is actually just um, a way of confirming that what you see doesn't go away when you enter the controls. But you've already seen it, so you know it's true. Now you know, now you can measure exactly how true it is and you can get some metrics on 
how precise your knowledge is, but uh, seeing is believing. Uh, and by that, I mean seeing graphs, not seeing uh, tables. Ironic, this should come from me because I have so much training in using statistical software to make tables. Um, but it's uh, graphs are even better combined with, with the tables. Um, in the interest of time, we'll, we'll move on to your other initiatives, although, although I, I think there will be questions about, uh, about this graphical unit, sort of this improving graphical uh, presentation uh, uh, initiative. Um, your, your other initiative, which was one of the pioneering initiatives for, for journals in, the, in our field, although they exist, of course, in other fields before, uh, including in science, where you drew uh, some of your inspirations, as you alluded to. Um, uh, pertains to uh, the formation of a, of a methods advisory panel, and uh, which you described at the time as an experiment in sort of uh, having uh, uh, manuscripts read through by a methods specialist, if I may say. But you can perhaps better tell us what the intent is and where you see that fit into uh, the development of our field and. Uh, uh, people's trainings and priorities. Mm -hmm. So actually when I uh, started that initiative, I, I didn't know of any journals that used it. it I'm, I'm sure it was a reinvention, uh, but based on my limited knowledge, it was an uh, invention. I, I hadn't heard of it. Uh, the motivation was quite clear. Um, there, it's not unusual practice uh, for associate editors and editors to if the paper looks slightly complicated to have the, the methods reviewer, the one that's known to be a little bit solid in methodology, um, which is, is really a waste because um, the methods reviewer doesn't necessarily know the, the theory or the phenomenon or the industry or anything else particularly well. And, and so uh, you're ending up with two good reviewers and then the third one who mainly checks the method, um, uh, it's really inefficient. Uh, so why not just have all three reviewers uh, be very close um, to the paper along all dimensions except or are not necessarily uh, in the method and then send it to um, somebody on the, the methodology panel uh, if it looks like some methodology assessment is necessary. Uh, because methodology for somebody who, who knows it well, it's very easy to check. It doesn't take time at all. Um, just much more efficient way of doing it. Plus we, we're selective about it. I mean, uh, as I usually say, uh, a paper doesn't make it to the methodology check unless it is at risk of, of getting a revision request. Um, so, uh, so that means most of papers never make it there. That's an easy, but again, not, not easy to, to say. What would you then say that uh, you would advise authors to do given these two initiatives? Should they bring their papers, say it's, a, it's an econometrics paper, should they bring their paper to an econometrician to sort of have a preview of what your uh, methods advisory panel may, may guess? Should they, should they reach out to their colleagues in, uh, in other schools or, or at least departments uh, for advice on, uh, on, uh, on uh, graphing their, 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 their raw data better and, uh, and better presenting the, the underlying uh, sources and mechanisms? Um, would you say there are exemplary papers out there? What, what, what can authors do to uh, sort of anticipate that um, these, these processes that, uh, and these questions that they'll face if they, if they aim to publish in ASP and arguably in other journals mm -hmm. that are adding at least methods panels and, and following up with them? Some similar rules about the disclosure mm -hmm. of raw data, if not uh, its representation. Mm -hmm. So in terms of uh, methodology advisory um, board, that shouldn't really have to change what authors do. I mean, with, with reasonable training and, you know, if you're, the good thing to do as an author is to not use methods that you don't know 
well enough. You know, you go simple if necessary, <laughs> because the mistakes happen when they when people try to do things that are just a little more complicated than they realize, and and that's never a good idea. Um, so that part, there's really no, not really a big behavioral change that we're asking for. Um, and and keep in mind the methodology uh, advisors aren't there to reject papers. They are there to say there may be an issue here. <laughs> and and of course that uh, that message can either be incorporated into a revision request or a rejection, either one, depending on how interesting the paper is. And how interesting the paper is is really what's going to turn uh, what, what the outcome turns on. Um, the graphs, actually, I, I agree. There's there's a real problem because we're not used to making graphs. We don't have much much experience with it. Um, I, I take uh, some blame for not having brought out enough information about it. I mean, the PDWs are, are fantastic, but we need something on our website. Uh, we sh we should have more of it, but the journal has a preference of putting out its own papers. <laughs> to demonstrate uh, good graphs, and, and there are not that many of them yet. So uh, we'll, it will come, and I hope soon. All right, and then at some point, hopefully we'll have more of the uh, PDWs to, to draw upon. By the way, for those of you who may be interested, uh, these PDWs are collected, or links to them are collected on the ASQ blog, uh, so that you can see examples of, uh, of recent papers and authors of those papers commenting on how they went about uh, graphical representation of their results. We're almost at the end of the interview part here, in fact, uh, slightly over time. So please keep your questions coming. I have just one last question for you, uh, Henrik, returning to uh, this uh, unusual and on some level exemplary, or it's to me at least inspiring uh, uh, personal trajectory that you took. Um, just one last question, and then we'll turn to questions and uh, we have a good number of questions available now. Um, if you were to point to one academic tradition or habit that uh, you've experienced or, exp uh, or, or, or lived yourself, uh, whether it be, uh, well, I guess let's try to take one each from uh, Norway, uh, Japan, and California. Uh, what would be these uh, traditions that may not be obvious, may not be common, but that you find inspiring, hopefully for the better, sometimes maybe not for the better, but still, what are your sort of takeaways from an institutional standpoint from the, from the different continents and places where you've worked? I mean, uh, the... Uh... The, an the only answer I can uh, give is a strikingly obvious one, but it's it's the correct answer. And it's uh, on on the coast in the U.S. So definitely the Californian experience is uh, just assemble enough smart people under the same roof and just take a step away, and good things will happen. Um, it's true, even when some of them are, are highly individualistic in how they think and work, like I am, um, just mix them up and there will be conversations and sharing of ideas that lead to papers. I think you uh, pointed to the, um, the award that I got last year for the paper and, and AMJ. Uh, that was on uh, the effects of pandemic, the Spanish flu, uh, which was just something that came out of conversations, um, just me and, and Hagi Rao. Um, it was a paper that we wrote w without any premonition that uh, we were going to be ex under a pandemic uh, after publishing it. Uh, it was just curiosity driven by conversations leading to a paper and and now we're sitting there and it's uh, it's it's almost scary how topical that paper uh, became soon after it was published indeed okay so in the interest of time we we will stop here clearly the inspiration keeps coming to you and through you so uh, 
uh, I will, we'll start with a couple of questions that were from people who I see already had their cameras on. So uh, Francisca and then uh, Arkan will, uh, will, uh, will do it. What we'll do now in this uh, phase of, the, uh, of this Meet the Scholar session is uh, we'll uh, uh, encourage you individually, if, you have, if, you, if I call upon you or uh, Nell and, uh, and Tom may, uh, may equally do so. Uh, to uh, open your cam, open your microphone, and and ask your question directly of uh, of, uh, of Henrik. And if uh, we have a few questions that uh, uh, were sent by people who may not be on the online, which we may ask of you later. But we'll start with uh, Francisca and uh, and then Henrik, simply because I see that you both have your cameras already on, and you have fascinating questions that you've already uh, raised. So Francisca, please uh, take the take the, the screen and uh, we look forward to hearing your question. And of course, Henrik, we look forward to your answer. Yeah, thanks a lot. That was uh, super interesting. And I would like to follow up a bit on, on the topic of um, multiple goals. And um, I would be interested and yeah, might already be in your books. I'm already looking forward to that one. Um, what is the most fascinating aspect related to research on multiple goals for you? Um, and maybe what was the most striking aspect while working on it for you when you started to work on it? Well, we haven't come so far in, in multiple goal research, but um, I think the, the strong feeling or, or suspicion I have uh, is that uh, this is one area where the, the original uh, specification and the behavior theory of the firm is very incomplete because it, uh, it didn't deal with all the different ways that goals could be interrelated to each other. And, and so there's a simple idea of, of you know, sequential attention to goals, uh, which makes sense, but there are some assumptions behind it. And if you start looking at pairings or even triplings of goals, you realize that that's not always true because the priority ranking may not be stable over time or it may be unclear. Um, there can be uh, intervening factors like uh, I believe that many organizations currently because of, of the events now have different goal structures that they, than what they had six months ago. Um, so there are all of these things happening. Um, uh, so that's that's the concrete answer. It it reminds me of something I, I didn't say about making theory. Um, just a personal note on that. I think uh, how I deal with theory is a bit influenced by my background doing programming because one important way of one important activity for programmers is to debug. And debugging doesn't just mean that you fix errors when they happen. It means that you look for errors. You try to break things. And, and you can deal with theories the same way. You can try to break them. Look at how they can be wrong. And then you debug them by first breaking and then fixing. And, and so uh, the sequential attention to goals is a fantastic idea that will often work and is also one that looks really easy to break. Well, I hope that addressed the, your, your question, Francisca. I think uh, that is certainly an ambitious research program. Great, thanks a lot. Yes. All right, uh, we'll take Hakan's question and then uh, for the interest of time, I'm following more or less the, the flow of our, of our chat here. Maybe Buki, uh, even though you don't have your camera doesn't work, please uh, get ready to, to ask your question, hopefully via your, via your microphone. We'll start, uh, we'll go next to Haka. Hi everyone. Well, first of all, let me say how grateful I am for this special time with Henrik. Uh, you know, it's been more than 10 years since Henrik trained me while I was a PhD student. And I was so respectful of Henrik's time that some of his personal background that he explained during this meeting now, I had never heard before. So I'm extremely grateful to the SDR division for making it available to everyone, including Henrik's former students. Thank you for that. And Henrik, it's a pleasure to see you. It was a great joy to be your student because you were always so tolerant. And I feel like things I didn't really notice at the time about how you trained students 
could be really useful to me now, now that I'm beginning to train more students, mm -hmm. and of course to the others on this call. So I want to ask you about whether you could describe how how you train students and how that's changed over time, if it has changed in any way. And of course, PhD students are the maybe the most relevant aspect of why I'm asking this question to you. Mm. But I would also like to understand whether your approach to PhD students has been different compared to students at other levels when you were in the classroom. So please tell us, and including your former student here, what that process looks like now and whether it's changed over time. Right. Um, it's good, very good to see you again. I saw your name immediately when you came up. Um, so, um, uh, so training of PhD students is one of the things that I really didn't learn as well as I should have. I mean, I picked up so many useful skills from you, March. Uh, but not the training part. Uh, there, is, there are just some things that are just hard to catch. But uh, there, there are some, uh, but I, I know how I'm different from many others. Um, uh, in some ways, I'm actually pretty lazy because I want ideas to come from the student. Um, I, I don't like to hand out stuff uh, because there's a creativity part of it. And, um, and creativity is actually trained through repetition. Um, now, part of that is to keep shooting down ideas that aren't quite good enough, but that's that's fine. That trains the creativity, and it also um, is a way of learning how to deal with critique, both in terms of hearing that your fantastic things aren't that fantastic. Um, and in terms of actually using that to make them better. Um, I, I haven't yet come to the point when I can finish, uh, listen to a presentation by a PhD student and, and answer in two sentences. Uh, <laughs> in fact, I think I say quite a lot more than that. Um, but it, it really is an exchange where um, a lot of the raw material uh, and a lot of processing also um, is done by the, the PhD student because uh, they are the ones, it is training and you don't, um, you, you want people to be working their tools and, and showing uh, them that maybe it's a little better if you do it the following way and so on. Yeah. How does it compare with other kinds of students? Um, there is really no comparison. Uh, it, uh, uh, I, I don't afford uh, the same kind of individual attention to any other kind of student. Um, and most of my teaching is executive. Um, so naturally, I, I listen very carefully to them and, and you know, I, I try to be helpful, but uh, it's not the same level. <laughs> Thank you, Akin. I think uh, I think you've uh, yes. The inspiration keeps coming, doesn't it? Yes. Um, all right. Uh, we've we've now worked partly through uh, questions that were sent offline by people like this, whom I can identify on the on the chat. We'll now move on to a rookie's question, and after that, uh, I believe there's a question that's either from uh, Vivian or from uh, you, uh, perhaps now Me. that uh, you can raise. But let's first uh, get rookie's question. Okay, the camera may not be working, so we'll just have to listen in intently on the uh, on the on the audio feed. But her question is also available on the chat if you want to see it, mm -hmm. uh, Henrik. All right, thank you very much, uh, Javier. So I apologize, everyone. For some reason, I when I turn on my video, it doesn't come on, and probably usually maybe if I shut down, that would fix that. But we don't have time um, for that. Um, Henrich, I want to say a huge thank you. We exchanged a couple of emails a few weeks ago. It was the kindest, most encouraging rejection you could ever receive. And uh, it was a very um, encouraging letter at the time. As someone who's just starting out in my career, I have very strong interest in micro foundations generally. A, a lot of it is also driven by my personal background where I am very detailed oriented. So I'm very, as a strategy scholar, I'm very 
interested in understanding how across levels different things lead to this outcome that we like to study. But at the same time, we know that there's equifinality. And I also have this strong inclination to want to come up with uh, research outcomes that, are, that can really help people in practice. But what I'm beginning to realize as I'm studying more and reading more is that the more, the more we try to link things across levels, is it, are we not likely to wind up in some form of theoretical incoherence where everything gets so muddled up that the theories are not as clear as they are anymore based on what Linda um, Agorte was suggesting, like Javier mentioned? And what are your thoughts about this? Thank you. So for clarity, um, all right, it's, uh, it's a good question because it's, it's actually quite a difficult uh, question. Um, clarity in, in predictions requires some simplicity. But of course, if you simplify things enough, uh, you know that they're going to be partially wrong. Um, just as a sheer result of simplification. So uh, the, the process is to simplify it and to pick the most important components and to throw away the components that are less important. And that's mm -hmm. purely a theoretical judgment with no evidence at all. Um, but there's a prediction in the end that, uh, that will have evidence attached to it. Um, it's actually very similar to what we're doing uh, in the book that we're writing now, uh, because one of the, again, it's debugging, we're trying to break a theory and, and, uh, and debug it, and the theory is performance feedback, uh, so I have some uh, personal uh, involvement in it. Um, one of the things that can prevent problemistic search from happening is self-enhancement, which we know occurs, uh, but then what do we know about when either problemistic search occurs or self-enhancement occurs? Well, self-enhancement is a psychological process. Um, how do you link that up the levels of analysis? Individual decision maker, uh, organization subunit, organization, environmental influences. Can you make it go all the way up and also at each step it has to be able to contend with problemistic search. It's, uh, it's a very difficult uh, theoretical uh, problem to solve, which means that there's some likelihood our solution is wrong, uh, but we have one. And uh, it's, it's clear, it's consistent. Um, in terms of theoretical reasoning, um, there, it looks like there's no mistake in the book manuscript as it is. Uh, but still, because we have simplified so much, may not work out empirically. So these are going to be interesting times if uh, people go ahead and test uh, this theory. So uh, I guess I'll allow myself to, to uh, just a, a brief follow-up question. Do, do you think that the, the Vero theory of the firm would work as an, as an individual level theory, say in a one-person enterprise, since amongst other things you, you have uh, you have taught uh, entrepreneurship? Um, it, is, it is a theory of an organization. It doesn't go further down than at least the group level or something like that. Um, we, we don't have a bit, I don't, if, if you take it down to the individual level, uh, what you have is, is already known under a different name in, in psychology. So it's, um, it, it gets trivial. It, it's goal setting theory, basically, is the closest uh, equivalent. Interesting. Thank you. All right. Uh, we will move on to, I guess, now. Uh, you, you also have a question which I think uh, speaks to uh, Henry's experience both as an author and as an editor. So, all the more appropriate yeah. to ask this question now. And then uh, in, the, uh, in the flow of things, uh, maybe uh, Georgina and then Erwin, you can prepare your respective questions. Thanks, Xavier. Right. And, uh, and then... Thank you, Henrik, for again, giving us your time and your wisdom. Um, so I was reflecting a little bit on your early experiences because as Xavier pointed out, they're quite different from what at least you would see uh, scholars do today. And in particular, I was thinking more about this role of co-authors 
And a large part of what they do for me, especially their experience, is in understanding how to navigate the review process. So I was even more astounded to learn that not only did you publish um, solo authored stuff early on, but that you had a relatively straightforward review process. Uh, I guess I'm wondering, you know, do you have any sort of general trends that you've observed? I understand this is selecting from the dependent variable, uh, but things that junior faculty like myself, and I know there's a number of PhD students in the audience, things that we can keep in mind to sort of simplify that process. Because while I'm sure we all enjoy doing research, I'm also quite sure the majority of us have uh, complained about reviewers and the review process at some point in time. Well, to be precise, I should say that uh, in, in most of the papers, uh, the review process was relatively straightforward. Uh, the first uh, paper I submitted um, out of my dissertation uh, was very brutal because I didn't treat the reviewers the way they wanted to be treated and uh, I, I paid for that uh, but I learned quickly uh, and so that made things uh, smoother maybe maybe making some spectacular mistakes early on is a good advice I don't know uh, so uh, the um, I think this is again the type of advice that you should be very careful about and selective about, but uh, I find that uh, junior scholars these days uh, over think, over strategize and overwrite uh, when, especially in responses to reviewers. Um, and I, I think uh, there's a fair amount of, um, uh, some uh, amount of wasted effort uh, there, which isn't good for uh, for anybody in the process. Um, uh, just two things that uh, occurred to me. Um, the our managing editor, this was uh, half a year ago, uh, was reluctant to send one revision out for review, and just sent me an email saying, "Can you please look at it? This is excessively long." Um, uh, and I maybe we should tell the authors to shorten it. And I looked at it and I said, yes, it is excessively long, but it's not that much longer than many of them are these days. And I am i don't think I'm willing to tell them to shorten it because if it gets rejected, which could well happen, after I tell them to shorten it, uh, I end up being uh, just completely the bad guy here. So let it go out and see what happens. Um, so that's that's one uh, dilemma that we have. Uh, the other one, which is something I've explained occasionally in, in TDWs, but I don't get to say it often enough. Um, the, the journal only cares about the paper, not about uh, the response to reviewers. And the paper has to be um, meet the standards of the journal. And, and that actually means that there is no social contract in the decision letter and uh, the reviews. So you, you can answer wonderfully, uh, but um, if the paper still isn't good enough, it doesn't come into the journal. So which, and this really tells you where the effort should be. I mean, uh, the, the responses are there for explaining what's happened to the paper. Uh, the responses are not to prove that you have fulfilled your part of the social contract because there is no social contract. It's all about the paper. Oh, any, any thoughts? Uh, Thank you. Yeah? Well, if I translate that to my uh, simple brain, it's keep it simple, stupid, and work on the paper, which I guess is generally good advice. <laughs> The, the paper is determines things really it's uh, that's what we look at Defin I mean it, it's especially true uh, it gets more true the more experienced the editor is uh, although actually not in exactly in the way that you uh, might imagine because uh, if an experienced editor looks at the paper that might be controversial that editor is looking at gold 
We want that. Thank you. Very, very helpful. We have, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you indeed. Uh, so we have time for three more questions. We'll try to squeeze them in uh, rather uh, quickly, given uh, that we try to, to stick to a two hour envelope for this recording uh, purposes. Um, we'll uh, go to Georgina first and then uh, quickly to uh, Herwin and uh, I think Tom uh, may have a question as well. But first, uh, Georgina, let's hear your question. Uh, good evening from Hong Kong. I'm the year one PhD student from HKUST. So thank you for the organization sharing. So actually you have partially answered my question is that, uh, can you share more about your opinion on the life cycle of the future of some fields like your expertise in the organizational networks, organizational learning and entrepreneurship? Oh. <laughs> Well, I've cared all, enough about all of them and still do. So I think they're going to be uh, fruitful for a very long time. I mean, uh, they, uh, oh dear, I, do I want to follow emotion or, or be, or try to predict more when I answer this question? I, I know that learning theory has expanded a lot and I, I keep saying it's a very flexible toolkit. I, I don't know when the expansion will end. Um, it's, it's going to uh, keep growing, I think. Um, I, uh, I think that uh, part of what's happened to learning or to, to network theory is that there has been a little bit of a break in the development of it. It doesn't move forward as quickly now as it uh, used to before. Uh, it's partly the fault of people like me, in fact, because we... Um, we started being interested in dynamic networks and how networks uh, changed over time, which meant that the data collection just uh, costs just skyrocketed, uh, which hasn't been good for the field. And um, um, I think the next round of, of network research is really uh, looking at the structure of the network along with the characteristics of the nodes, which is more complicated theoretically, uh, but um, it actually makes data collection much cheaper than the dynamic networks that we were looking at. So I think um, it's, it's, uh, it will be a good time for network analysis as long as, as soon as people switch to that type of theory and analysis, uh, it will probably accelerate again. And I'm sorry for slowing it down by doing dynamic networks. Um, entrepreneurship, I don't know, it just keeps expanding and, and it's not, I'm not saying that because I have a, um, a chaired professorship in it. I, I just observe that it expands. Um, it is an interesting interface between organization theory and strategy and other things that we don't quite know what is. Because it's not a full-size enterprise yet. It has a strategy, but it's, the strategy isn't as stable as it usually is. Uh, they interact often more with the market than they do as an organization. Entrepreneurial ventures are, are strange creatures that we need to know more about. So I think those are good things to study, all three of them. Yeah, thanks a lot. All right, thank you, Georgina. Um, all right, we'll change gear, I, I, I suspect, a little bit with um, with uh, uh, Erwin's uh, question. Um, so go ahead, Erwin. Hi, this Hi. is... Oh. Okay, okay. Zoom. 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 Sorry about Sorry. that. Zoom. Oh, excuse me. Let me, uh, let me switch this off. Okay, <laughs> terrible. Okay, do you hear me? Yeah. Do you hear me? Yes, we do. Okay, thank you so much, sorry about that. So I had two devices. So my advice to you is don't use two devices while you're doing one Zoom call. Uh, <laughs> so hi, Henry, thanks so much for your time. Um, I was, I, I had a, a, a question about um, 
relevance of our research to practice? Do you think uh, that we should uh, pursue this in all cases? Uh, it seemed like some journals are kind of trying to stretch that, um, not mm -hmm. making names, but trying to really trying hard to reach practitioners, have some sort of formats uh, uh, that would reach practitioners, have a particular summary for practitioners, have uh, videos for practitioners, uh, that kind of thing. Do you, you in, in general, what do you think about that? And plus, by the way, you mentioned that you teach mostly executives, which I think is very interesting because you do this very uh, profound theory work and, and very academic work, um, but then you're also teaching executives. And I think I remember, correct me if I'm wrong, that you did research on uh, forbearance and you had a debate with somebody at, in some journal about the practical relevance uh, of that research and I may be wrong mm -hmm. about that but I mm -hmm. bigger remember uh, you addressing this person I, I think you com completely uh, killed them because you you had very strong arguments for why this you know esoteric concept of mutual forbearance was actually practically relevant yeah so I, I won't comment on whether I, I kill my counterparts in the uh, debate not the yes, of the debate. Uh, and I don't back when I'm in debate. Uh, the, um, uh, I think what a lot of people don't recognize is that uh, there really are, are two types of uh, researchers. And, and I, I know I'm simplifying uh, because a lot of, most people are a blend of the two, but there, there is the, the curiosity type that just gets motivation out of being curious about stuff. And then there is the importance type who gets motivation uh, because there are things that are important for us to, to understand and deal with. Um, and um, I, I'm, I think I correctly identify myself as a, the curiosity type. Uh, which means that I'm actually less practical than the importance type because in, in general, uh, they're more or less right about what's important. Uh, they're not always right about how important they are to what's important, but at least they can identify what's important. Um, and the curious thing is just that we look at stuff and we wonder about it, right? Um, and so I think I do a fair amount of things that uh, you have to think carefully about to see the practical value. Um, but that's not necessarily my job uh, because it, it adds to body of knowledge and people will find ways of applying it. In fact, in, in my other role as a writer of, of the blog, I take research you know, by a number of authors of different types. Some of them are importance authors and some of them are curiosity authors. And I try to get something useful out of each and every article. And interestingly, it's not hard. Um, I, I have a feeling that uh, this, there's something that happens to people who work in business schools. We, we just can't get very impractical. <laughs> Uh, because of the teaching environment or, or something like that. So uh, to the extent that there is a debate at all in, in business journals, it's, uh, it's a funny debate because it's not well connected with uh, the daily life of, of business scholars. Do you feel that we, we kind of have a hang up on being practical? Yeah, we have a hang up on being practical when we are overly practical from the viewpoint of most departments, including engineering. Mm -hmm. Going back indeed to your to, to data presentation, right? Um, thank you, and really, I hope that was uh, that was helpful. I believe uh, I believe Tom's question maybe uh, in some ways related with that. If we have just a minute left at the end, Sergey, we'll try to to squeeze in your question, although it's a broad question that we I might. Uh, take to you, I, I'll, I'll bring you that question later uh, uh, offline uh, if, if necessary. And of course, I'll, I'll let Sergei know your answer as well. Um, so let's go, let's go with our, our probably the last question for which we have formal time will be uh, Tom's question. Hey, Enric, uh, great to see you. Uh, thanks again so much for your time in this format. So I guess, um, you know, I, I've been listening and reflecting on a number of the uh, comments and, and things that have been uh, discussed in the chat. And 
in particular, this um, this uh, this theme that we just talked about with Erwin about you know uh, practical relevance, um, and I'm reflecting back on uh, some of the first uh, comments we had or question we had about multi-level theory and, and multi-level uh, thinking, and obviously that's an area that I um, I care about, so maybe that's why I'm focusing in on that. But I'm interested in um, you know a little bit of attention here, right? Uh, because um, uh, I think most organizations, most managers, would uh, w do think in multi-level, very, very multi-level ways, right? Um, I mean, to the point now where, you know, we're very aware of how individual level biases drive, uh, unconscious biases, mm -hmm. right, drive organizational action, right? So there's really clear linkages, I think, in most managers' minds about these, uh, about how, um, how things span levels. And of course, there's, you know, very robust theory on how things span levels. Um, Multi-level theory is, is a, is a well-developed theory in and of itself. Um, so I, I just want to understand a little bit more about what you were saying with respect to um, the linkages between levels. Uh, it, your, your answer to that first question, right? I heard you say that, um, that this, these linkages can't be generalized, that they need to be theory specific. So are you, are you saying then that, um, that there are a set of linkages that are specific to behavioral theory, right? Um, uh, that would have both theoretical and practical relevance, but that those linkages might be different for other uh, organization level theories? Or, or can you just expand a little bit on that comment? Oh, I can, uh, I can take it even further than what you said, because um, I mean, what are some of the tasks that uh, decision makers in uh, the behavioral theory of the firm uh, engage in? Uh, well, one of them is that they look at performance on a given goal variable, compare it to an aspiration level, and then they decide how to deal with it. Um, so do you engage in problematic search? Well, if you follow the text directly, that's what you'll do. Uh, but uh, self-enhancement is the other option, and there are various ways that you can self-enhance. The most obvious one is that all of a sudden, uh, especially because you've, um, you've read managerial accounting and you have a, a goal a dashboard, uh, which uh, means that you have something like 10 different goals. And so now you can point to the other, what, four or five goals where things are going well. And so, you know, you don't, there isn't really a problem. You, I'm actually doing fine. That's, that's an, a, that's a linkage, right? Because self-enhancement is uh, it's a psychological process which gets uh, enacted in uh, in the organization. That's just the way that I, I said, right? Um, that's one chapter of uh, the behavioral theory of firm. Take another chapter. Uh, take the one about dominant coalitions. Um, are they solving problems? They might be. Uh, but they might also just be doing simple stuff like allocating resources. Um, in fact, there's a number of, of situations that uh, a decision-making group with some power will engage in uh, where um, the decisions have in common that uh, some will get more than others depending on which way the decision goes. So it's, it's simple politics. And in that game, there really isn't problemistic search necessarily. There isn't self-enhancement either. What there is, is finding common ground, finding a rhetoric and persuading those who are uh, right in the middle of two, two fractions and getting them on your side. And this again is, these are micro behaviors. It's actually a, a register of micro behaviors and they will engage in all of them uh, to the extent that they know how to do it and to the extent that the, the, the structure is correct for it. So inside the behavioral theory of the firm, different uh, activities lead to different micro theories because they are solving different problems. I just I, I think what's sort of fascinating in your answer, right, is that um, you know you 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 so neatly I think span in sort of a nested way uh, these levels, right? Because I would suggest that a dominant coalition isn't going to uh, cohere around a goal that doesn't allow them to self-enhance, right? So I mean, no one's going. You know, we're not going to pick for the marketing department. We're not going to 
talk about, uh, you know, how um, let's focus on these really bad marketing or really, really bad accounting results. We're going to focus on how great marketing results, right? So we're going to self-enhance in our formation of our dominant, dominant coalition, of course, and then that drives organization level decisions as well, right? So, so there is this really interesting sort of um, emergence process where we go from the individual uh, constructs mm -hmm. like self-enhancement, balance rationality to these uh, sort of meso-level group structures, right, to organizational behavior. So it does seem like there's some really interesting action there. It's, um, it's a part where there's room for a lot more theory because, um, it, I mean, it's, it's totally true that uh, making theory that crosses uh, the levels, there hasn't been so much of it yet. Okay. Thank you so much. Well, we are just about at the end of our two hour uh, journey here. Uh, it's almost 11 or just about past 11 in, uh, in Singapore as well as uh, Vivian in Hong Kong and some of you maybe even later. Uh, so I think it's time for us to close this session. I'll simply invite you all to participate in, uh, in more sessions to mention just the next one that's coming up is with uh, uh, Rashri Agarwal uh, tomorrow uh, at uh, I believe uh, 12 noon uh, EST. So. Um, but keep, uh, you can keep abreast of the, of the list via the SDR website and uh, the SDR listserv as well. Thank you, um, everyone. I hope that this was uh, interesting to you as well. Um, uh, Henry, this has been certainly fascinating. I'd like you all to record your reaction now. Let's create a bit of a, of a, of a wall of, a, of applause for, uh, for our speaker. And... Uh, I want to uh, thank you again. Uh, the recording will be available online relatively, uh, relatively soon. Uh, and I will uh, follow up to the extent that I can, or that I at least can make sense of the, of the questions. I'll follow up with you, Henry, to continue this conversation with the SDR community. Uh, thank you for uh, making your time available again. And uh, see you later. I will uh, let uh, uh, Vivian uh, uh, close us off here in terms of uh, the session but uh, look for the recording uh, if you uh, missed any portion of today's, of today's uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you.